So as if it couldn't get any worse for the RTX 3080, given its abysmal launch, um, the fact that the 3090 just launched, there's some pretty bad news coming out of Igor's lab regarding the way a lot of these AIB cards were constructed. So we're gonna go ahead and today talk about the findings. We're gonna talk about why you're seeing various cards and reports of them crashing to desktop and doing all kinds of weird things all over Reddit. Now that we have actual concrete details as to what's causing the problem here. We've been following this story ever since we first heard, or I got the very first tweet of, Jay, did you hear that yada yada cards are crashing? And it's always been, well, so far I haven't really experienced too much weirdness, although I have experienced some weirdness, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, we're gonna go ahead and talk right now about what's happening, what could be done about it, and what this really means for the future of the 30 series cards. Today's video is sponsored by us and the quest for the truth. We're gonna tear apart some graphics cards today and see exactly what's happening. But you know what you can also do? Head to our merch store and buy some merch because I'm gonna be phasing it out and getting rid of it. So this is gonna be one of your last chances to buy a crappy Jay's Two Cents t-shirt. At least you get something for your money, even if it's crap. So like I already said, uh, all credit for the findings on this obviously goes to Igor's lab. We are amplifying that message that was found because it's important for our viewers to know the most accurate information they can into what it is that they're buying into. Now, the problem on a high level, if you haven't been paying any attention, is you can find all sorts of reports on Reddit, um, any other form, to be honest, Linus Tech Tip forums, where they are talking about this sort of stuff at an enthusiast level, or even just a layman level of going, I was playing a game and then I got kicked to the desktop, or CTD, not KTD, crashed to desktop. We've seen reports of, hey, I'll be gaming and then I'm just kicked to the desktop. Uh, or I'll be just gaming and then suddenly my card goes all wonky with crazy lines and stuff in the screen, which is usually indicative of some sort of a calculation error happening in the card. And it's becoming more and more widespread as people are starting to slowly get their hands on this. And this is a story that probably didn't have a lot of legs at the start because of not a lot of cards truly made it out into the wild. I mean, it looks like we might have seen worldwide only a couple thousand of these cards make their way into the wild. But as they start to trickle out, we're starting to see more and more uh, really alarming news about people showing, not just saying, but showing proof that their cards are crashing. What inevitably happens is this doggy pile when something happens. You'll get someone report something and you'll get other people that are just not fans of the brand like, yeah, it's happening to me too, but they don't really have the card. They're just regurgitating things that they've heard and telling everyone, hey, it crashes, it crashes but first-hand experience is very important in getting to the root of these types of problems. So now that we've seen enough proof of people showing videos and, and little you know, cell phone captures of their cards doing various weird things, Igor's lab seems to have gotten down to the root of the issue. Now understanding the root of the issue, you have to understand kind of actually a video we've already done about this, where we explain the difference between a Founders Edition card, a reference spec, and then an AIB build. So those are basically three different ways that these cards can be manufactured. So what we have right here, this is just the Founders Edition 3080. This is the card that NVIDIA built using their own custom diagram. They took their own reference spec and then they beefed it up and did a whole new card layout and the arrangement of the power delivery and components. Remember earlier in that video, and it's funny, I didn't even expect that video to really tie into this one, but it's a very good prerequisite watch in my opinion to understand what we're talking about here. The old reference spec basically just said, here's a layout of components, here's what will work, here are the minimum requirements to meet the needs of the GPU. That's power delivery, type of component, component layout, but it's basically, here's the bare minimum, right? 15 pieces of flare, whatever it is, and you're Brian over there wearing 33 pieces of flare, right? So a lot of the AIBs are like, we're going with all the flare. And some of them are like, you know what? To stay near MSI, MSRP, we are going with the bare minimum. Now the Founders Edition card is beefed up from all of that this year. I also said in there that what a lot of AIBs will do is they'll take the reference spec and then they'll add their own components on there. And that's sort of what's sort of leading into what today's problem is. Now Igor's lab did a very good write-up about the various capacitors that are on the back of the GPU. Um, we'll use this guy here for reference. This is the EBGA GeForce 3080XC3. Fortunately, a lot of these open backplates now allow us to see what's going on behind the GPU. And if you take a look at this arrangement right here, this is the backside of the GPU. In order to get the cleanest power to the GPU, you want the delivery as close, the final power delivery, I should say, as close to the component as possible. So there's less uh, contamination, crosstalk along the way, neighboring parts like memory and, and other things that use electricity on the board causing any sort of interference. 
These are also essentially filters that filter out the electrical noise that happens in a circuit. Jay, what do you mean electrical noise? Have you ever walked underneath the power line and you could just hear that thing just crackling away? That's just ESD and other things happening in the air and the environment. On a really dry day in California, you walk underneath the power line, you don't wanna stay there very long because it's just freaky hearing that thing just sound like, uh, what are those balls? They're like, are those, those two towers? Like, oh, yeah, it yeah, it sounds like those. If we take a look at the EVGA X3, XC3 card right here, you can see that in the middle, there's one little array that looks different than the rest. And that is what we're starting to see be the problem here. You have five of the, lar we'll just call them larger capacitors, and then you've got one array of the smaller, more expensive capacitors. The small array, where it's just a bunch of them, that's actually the more expensive layout. What appears to be happening here is a lot of AIBs, or some of the AIBs, have decided to cheap out on that particular design and have gone with six of the cheaper capacitors. And what's happening there is you're getting a lot of noise, a lot of crosstalk, and just a lot of interference to the GPU, close to the GPU, which is causing a very erratic behavior at its maximum clocks. Now, what do you mean by maximum clock? Remember my reference card, what's, what, how to understand 3080? I explained that you have a reference clock, and that's the number that like this guy right here said it's gonna go to 1740. But the moment we turn it on, it goes all the way up to like 1950. That's because of GPU boost. GPU boost says if we have power limit available to us and we have temperature headroom available to us and neither of those are one out of zero or one, means yes or no, then ramp up the clocks until we reach the top of our bin. The binning or the C state technically, or P state actually, C state's power, P state is, is the actual clock. There's a top limit there where it won't go above that unless you start manually adjusting the offset inside of afterburner or precision or whatever piece of program you're using to overclock your cards. It doesn't know what the build arrangement is. It doesn't know what the capacitors are. So what starts to happen is you have a card that will boost up potentially to a point to where it becomes very sensitive. You've, you've seen, right, we're, we're on the edge of these overclocks sometimes where we'll have one run crash and just go, you know what, let's try it again. Don't change a damn thing, run it, complete the benchmark and get a world record because that's how on the edge of stability that it is. Now add a subpar designed power delivery system on the backside of the GPU, creating extra ESD and noise, the GPU becomes extremely sensitive. You wanna talk about sensitivity? Do you know how many of our runs were failed because of this? My microphone, which is a wireless analog transmitter, there are times we actually tested it. Crash after crash after crash, I walk away or turn this microphone off, instant stability. Now imagine that noise being up against the GPU, which is exactly what's happening with the power delivery system. We're gonna take a look at what's on the Founders Edition card, and the reason why we haven't really been seeing any reports of Founders Edition cards crashing is because they have beefed up beyond this spec. I believe what we're gonna find here is two of those expensive arrays. And then in fact, some of the graphics card companies, I don't have one on hand, it was supposed to be here, it's still stuck in, in uh, import, which is the Asus Tough. 3080 apparently has all six of them as the expensive array. And these are the types of things that dictate the price of your card, how expensive the components are that go into it. So what I wanna do right now is I've got these four AIB cards that I sorta of just wanna take a little bit of a tour and I'll come on that side of the table. We'll take the back plates off because three of these have back plates that you can't see and then you have the EVGA card. Uh, and then we'll see exactly what we're finding underneath here. So removing the back plate here for our 3080 should reveal obviously their build spec. Yeah, and there it is, exactly as I said. So if we take a look here at the EVGA card, it's got the one expensive array of capacitors in there. If you take a look at the Founders Edition card down there, it's got two. So that's not bad. That's not like saying EVGA cheaped out. It's just saying on this card that's pretty close to MSRP, although it is more expensive than MS MSRP, is built to reference spec. And you can see right here that the Founders Edition card having two of them is probably why I was able to get higher clocks out of the Founders Edition card than I could get out of the EVGA card. And that's not just Silicon Lottery, that's not the potential of EVGA binning their own GPUs, saying we're keeping the best for ourselves. There's more to it than just Silicon Lottery. It's the quality of the power that's being delivered to it. So the teardown on the Gigabyte card has been not the most straightforward I've ever torn apart. Okay, so check that out. That looks like the reference PCB. Remember how we said that there's a, look, and they even did a little extendos, like we wish the founders had sort of done. This to me 
Looks like the picture I saw of the reference board. Remember I said there is a reference board, but I hadn't seen one? All right, so the back plate, believe it off, comes off last, <laughs> unlike most guards where it comes off first. So we've got three screws here to tear down. Why they did this, I have no idea. And there's six of the cheap array, as you can see right there. The problem is all the cards that are having the worst reports of crashes have this array with the six cheap pulse caps and not the MLCCs. Here we go. So this is actually the big boy. <laughs> this probably weighs almost as much as a 3090. <laughs> this is the iGame or Colorfuls um, card. I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> oh, the Advanced OC10G. Now I'm gonna give Colorful the benefit of the doubt here before we look in the back. Let me explain why. I, this is one of the first cards I received, but they also were the first brand to reach out to me and say, hey, Something's going on and we're not sure what yet. It's ex specific to this button right here. This is an OC button. It's a little toggle switch. It's a toggle in and a toggle out. This is kind of like the button you found on the old Galax cards, which is like just a physical OC button. And by pushing that enables a higher core clock on demand. One of the things that they reported back to me was, hey, uh, we need to send you a new card because that button is causing crashing. And I went, okay, fine. Uh, I will hold off on my review because I'm not going to hold it against, against a company to find something wrong, proactively say, hey, we're going to fix this. Don't, uh, this, is, this card is not indicative of Jay's ability to hold a screwdriver. I'm not going to hold it against a brand that finds a problem and then is like, hey, hold off on this. I don't know if this card is in public, is in the public yet. So the question is, did they sell the card knowing there's a problem? I don't know. But now I'm curious as to whether or not maybe this is the problem they found. It's also very likely the brands may not have even known this was a problem because they're building, remember, they build cards to spec before they can even run them because the driver is the very last piece of the puzzle that NVIDIA provides to the AIBs and such. And as such, if they start doing their testing and they go, uh-oh, I will give any brand that says, uh-oh, there's a problem publicly. No, they have they've said it to me, not necessarily publicly. I will give them the credit because that's the right thing to do. All right, so the cooler is now separated. I've not fired this up yet, but look at this guy. It's all metal too. Watch, watch when I put this down. <laughs> Dude, this thing's got some thermal pads on the back. All right, what are we gonna find here? The cheap array. So I'm gonna give Colorful some benefit here because like I said, they straight up before the launch were like, hey, Problem identified. We're not sure what's happening yet, but crashing while overclocking, especially when pushing that button. And I can tell you now that probably means that with their overclock button, it's pushing the frequency too high. It gets too noisy with the power draw. And then what happens here is you get a crash. So this is the MSI Gaming X Trio, the 3090. And remember this card just launched. And you can see here, it's got two of the MLCC arrays in there, not, the, not six of the cheap ones. So I was kind of curious on whether or not that is the spec for the 3090. And I'm gonna take the back plate off the 3090 real quick and then just see what it is. We'll talk about what the brands can do about this, how they can make it right and how this could be a potential problem. <sighs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is gonna be almost like 3.5 gigabytes all over again, but not really. <sighs> we'll just talk about it in a sec. Prediction time, Phil. One or two MLCCs like the 3080 FE, which has two. I think two like the FE. I think two is realistic as well because MSI has two. And it's so far, I don't have the 3080 card, but it seems like the MSI card is following spec. And it did. Oh, I got the stupid SLI thing in the way. All right, here we go. Da, 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 da. It's got two. Now that I've created a GPU graveyard, let's talk about what could be done about this. And I know no matter what I say, people are gonna say, you're covering for NVIDIA. If I were covering for NVIDIA, I would have never made this video, obviously. We're independent here. I'm not controlled by NVIDIA. In fact, I had some pretty interesting things to say to NVIDIA about the whole 8K early launch thing. It's important to remember GPU boost is the key factor here as to what's causing this problem. When you buy a graphics card, whether it's from AMD or NVIDIA, or even in the future, Intel, you are only guaranteed the number printed on the spec sheet for that card. For instance, the FE is 1740 megahertz. I already told you it goes 200 megahertz beyond that because of GPU boost. 
However, the number you are guaranteed and promised and are buying is the 1740. If that doesn't make sense to you, you can't come to my birthday party because this is the root of the issue here. But Jay, GPU boost is an NVIDIA technology and if it's breaking the cards and that's bad, you're absolutely right. That is bad because the problem now falls down on the AIB partners building their cards and potentially cutting corners like we've seen with the colorful here and like we've seen with the gigabyte. Because as far as we can tell from Igor's article is that single MLCC on there with five of the uh, pulse caps are the spec. And if they decide to do six pulse caps because they are significantly cheaper than that other array, not just in cost, but manufacturing, each one of those little deals has gotta be soldered on there and tested and, and tooled. That is a lot more expensive. The fix here is going to be for these brands that have cards that are already in the wild with VBIOS P states that go too high are going to have to issue a firmware update that reduce those clocks. What does that mean to you? It means your card is not going to boost as high as it potentially did. Now it does not mean everyone is having this problem. Different loads, different conditions, different cooling of your case. If you've got a case that's choking off your card and it's getting really hot in there, it's probably not making it to that top boost bin anyway, which means you may not have noticed a problem because of the simple fact that it's not boosting as high because GP boost isn't getting the headroom it needs temperature wise. Remember, the closer you get to that set value of temperature, the lower your clocks will be to maintain going beyond it. You don't wanna go beyond it, and it can only do that by controlling voltage and core clock. That's how you control temperature. But if you've got a water-cooled card, that's, if you, if you suddenly put a water block on one of these AIB cards, and now you're getting boost bins that are going higher and trying to maintain it longer, that's where the problem's gonna to start to creep up. So unfortunately, the only way I can see there being a fix that keeps you from crashing is a VBIOS that reduces those clocks. So you can look at this one of two ways. I'm getting less than I paid for. I don't think that's a leg to stand on because GPU boost, unfortunately, is trying to go higher than the components are being allowed. So that falls on the AIB's choices of the way they manufacture these cards, not so much NVIDIA. However, if you're not maintaining those clocks anyway and you're crashing at one, you know, it's funny, one 15 megahertz bin could be the difference of what's happening here. And we've experienced this hundreds of times, maybe even thousands of times, and all the overclocking we've done where I'm like, let's push it one bin higher, one 15 megahertz step higher, and then get all sorts of instability. You can look at it that way. You can also have a right to be angry with the AIBs if the facts are they built under spec. But there are some things you can actually do in the meantime while you wait for the brands and NVIDIA or whoever's gonna have to own up to these issues that are widespread. Enough people have mentioned it now, you have to take it serious. You can't just ignore this problem. You can go into MSI Afterburner and pull your power limit down to like 95%. Or you can offset your clock by like minus 50. Like I said, 15 megahertz sometimes is what it takes to make these cards just act super weird and start crashing. So if you do like a negative 25 or a negative 50 and play around with the underclock, which really sucks to do a negative offset, but so does crashing in the middle of your game, at least you can do that in the meantime. But it's starting to look like maybe, I've seen some reports of, hey, Everyone be careful when you buy a Zotac card. I even saw it today because someone, uh, the guy that was doing the live stream from Tustin got himself a Zotac card. I saw people saying, hey, be careful, Zotac's undervolting and underlimiting their cards and we don't know why and I think now we know why. Some, I think some of these brands figured this out in their own testing and then through v, v, or VBIOS updates of their own before the cards were sent to retailers, they artificially reduced the clocks, making them look like slower cards than they should be. But again, there's that double-edged sword. It's still boosting higher than the 17 whatever number that these cards are advertising. The problem is, in the BIOS, their boost bin tables are set higher than the actual stability point of these cards. So the cards that are meeting or exceeding that reference spec you're seeing have bigger power sliders. That's how that's always been. You have overbuilt power delivery system, more power available to it, more power, potentially higher overclocks. And it all plays together as a system. And if you have one component in that system that is not up to spec, the entire system fails. Especially a filter, which is like the last line of defense for the cleanliness of the power being delivered to the GPU. And if that's noisy, the GPU can't, can't think with all the noise. It's the best way, like imagine being in a library and it's a frat party going on, you're trying to study for finals. That's kind of what's happening. And you're getting pushed to do it faster because- And you're getting pushed to do it faster while they're all bumping into you and spilling beer on you and crap. That's what's happening in the GPU with these under-spec power delivery systems. You have the variants of six pulse caps in some of these brands, or like Asus, which has six of the MLCCs. 
And I, I wish I had an EVGA for the win uh, card here because I have a feeling that it would probably be the six because that's a very overbuilt delivery system. So this might be a blessing in disguise for those of you that couldn't get your cards because you would be a part of all this. And now you have the option of waiting and seeing how this is handled. Right before AMD launches their big Navi card, which of course, the closer we get to that, the rumors are starting to say it's probably faster than the 3080. I don't know what information they're going on to base that. But if you see a card from AMD now that's potentially faster than the 3080 and it doesn't have these, these problems, that could potentially be a good thing. Do I see these AIBs retooling and remanufacturing? I don't. Do I see them coming out with vBIOS updates that will reduce your clocks? I do. You know why? Because that's the free option. Anyway, I hope this has shed some light on the problem. As far as we can tell, we'll obviously be staying tuned to see what new developments come. Unfortunately, silence is a bad thing in this instance. And both NVIDIA and the AIBs have been extremely quiet, which is kind of funny. Phil and I think there might even be a, a, a mandate coming from NVIDIA where they can't talk about this. This needs to be mums the word. And the problem is the quieter you are on these types of subjects, the more open to interpretation and speculation people become, which is why it's important to tear these apart and start comparing the data. If I were Asus, I'd want to be waving my arms saying, hey, look at us, look at the way we built it. We did it way better. <laughs> but they're not even saying that because I think until the findings are concrete and there's so many different players involved, I have a feeling that this is gonna be a story that the 3080 was the best graphics card that could have been. All right guys, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something today. We'll see you in the next one.